Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to another Adult Improver edition of Perpetual Chess. Just in case you have not heard one of these before, instead of, um, well, these, this is an interview where we will sp- place a special emphasis on chess improvement. So we like to seek people out who've, shown, who've made great strides in their chess games and try to figure out what their secrets are. Um, and in th- this time in the world in particular, I thought it would be a good time to to go hard on adult improvement. Um, I did a little poll with the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters asking if they wanted us to do more of these because I know a lot of people are stuck at home, myself included, and chess can be a great diversion or this can be a great time to sharpen up your chess game while you're stuck at home. And the results were pretty overwhelming. The, The listeners or at least supporters of the show wanted to hear lots of adult improver interviews. So as long as we're all stuck here at home, I'm going to try to do at least one of these a month, maybe even more. We'll see how it goes. And I'm excited to bring in our first guests in a minute. The Well, our first guests here with this quarantine edition of uh, adult improver interviews. But I also just wanted to mention, of course, we've been tracking the candidates tournament closely as has the rest of the chess world i'm recording we are recording here on friday march 27th so it has been postponed it's a big controversy but tori who i'll introduce in a minute and myself i don't think we're going to talk about it too much there's been amazing coverage already by chess.com and chess 24 and uh jakob argard had a good interview with u.s chess and uh kostya kovutsky has been covering it um so on and so forth. Um, there's so much coverage that, that you guys can seek out. So, um, if you would like to hear from the FIDE officials and Roger Bavon did an interview with chess.com and so on and so forth. So I'm sure eventually on Perpetual Chess, I'll be covering this, but it won't be this week and it won't be next week either because that episode is already recorded. Um, so I think you guys can get your fill of that coverage. So here we're just going to talk some chess improvement and hear our guest story. So with all of that out of the way, I would like to introduce her. She is a 23-year-old Twitch streamer, uh, best known as her her online moniker, Gold Dust Tori. She started seriously pursuing chess in November of 2018 and has taken her chess.com rating from non-existent to about 1,600 in that time. Um gaining about 600 points on chess.com in the past year alone and doing a lot of it while she's streaming, which is pretty impressive. So, and she's been a uh, frequently uh, requested guest, popular Twitch streamer, popular on Twitter. Um, so I'm excited to bring her in. So Tori, with that all out of the way, how are you holding up, Tori? I am doing pretty good. How are you? Oh, I'm worn out. As I was telling you before, yeah. <laughs> before we started recording, I'm I'm not used to uh, chasing my little kids around all day every day. But that's uh, the new normal for me. So, oh but, yeah. But other than that, uh, everything is good, and and I'm excited for this interview. So, uh, are you uh, obeying the uh, stay at home um, directives that we've been issued? I am. I've been really lucky, and my life hasn't changed too much between streaming and online classes. So, I've been really lucky in that sense. Yeah, I mean, it's it's good. I mean. We'll see how long this goes on. It it could be mm-hmm. interesting, but I know that you've uh, you mentioned um, you've been grinding hard on the chess. We'll we'll get to that, and that's of mm-hmm. course the main topic of our conversation, Tori. But but before we do that, um, for listeners either who haven't seen your streams or have seen your streams but but don't know that much about um, how you um, like what your background is and how you got into chess, could you tell us a bit more? Um, Yeah, um, it's actually I really like to tell my story because I remember when I was a kid, my dad played chess a little bit. And you would think I got into chess because of him, but that's not actually what happened. (laughs) But he showed me how the pieces moved. And that's all I knew for, I guess, 21 years of my life. And then I was streaming another game, World of Warcraft, before I streamed chess. And I went to a convention that is popular. It's called TwitchCon, and it's where a bunch of streamers get together. And I actually met up with, um, as a lot of you guys probably know, like um, the Chess Bros, so Eric Hansen, um, Alexandra Botez, um, John Urschel, Danny Wrench, all those people. I met up with them, and 
they um at the time they're like you should stream chess you should stream chess and i said no i'm never gonna stream chess because i was very at that time i didn't know how to play uh, besides just how the pieces move so i was very embarrassed of my play and so i was like i'm never gonna play it or i'm never gonna stream it and then i got back home and a week later um i ended up starting to stream it and now I'm here. <laughs> Excellent. So. Well, that's a, that's a good success story. And where is home, Tori? Um, it is in Minnesota. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, we've we've had uh, John Bartholomew of uh, Minnesota fame on a couple times, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's crazy. I mean, uh, that's I had a suspicion um, that you might have a Twitch background just because from from our limited interactions, I knew that it sounded like you kind of hit the ground running, like you sort of started chess and Twitch streaming at the same time, which mm-hmm. if you didn't have a Twitch streaming background w- would be um, like, that would be even more unusual. So how did you, what was your War of World of Warcraft Twitch streaming experience like? Uh, it's actually, comp- my stream now is completely different from back then. Back then I had a very small stream. So a lot of people think that I had a big stream when I streamed World of Warcraft, but I was only getting maybe 15, 20 average viewers on like a good day. <laughs> so, um, I mean, going from that to where I'm at now is really mind boggling to me. I never would have seen me get like 200 average viewers organically back then, um, and I don't know, it's been really great. I'm really glad that I switched over to chess um, to be here now. Yeah, and obviously you must have some facility for it. I mean, you've made fast progress, um, mm-hmm. which which again, we'll, we'll get into a bit more. We should probably define Twitch streaming just in case um, there's any other dinosaurs. I've figured it out over time, obviously, but there's probably mm-hmm. uh, some other people who live their lives a little more offline who might be wondering what a Twitch streamer is. So, Tori, um, how, how do you explain it when you run into people uh, who don't don't aren't familiar with Twitch streaming? Yeah, um, I actually have to answer this question a lot because people are like, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I stream and I have to answer this a lot. So um, live streaming is basically um, you're doing something. That, I mean, there's so many different categories nowadays. You can do like a just chatting where you just um, it's just a webcam of you and you're just talking to the people that are watching you, your viewers. Um, with chess, you got the chess board on the screen and you have like a webcam and you show like how you're playing um, and you can challenge viewers. Um, so it's like all like um, like in real life interaction and like um, the same time. So there's no delay. Um, so that's really great because you're basically having a conversation with your viewers. Yeah, uh, it really is quite interactive. As I mentioned to you um, before we were recording, I did get to watch you a little bit yesterday while I was uh, getting getting dinner ready for my family. And yeah, you, you go out of your way to say hi to everyone. It seemed like you have a lot of sort of regulars. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can see how that, that fosters a community. And I, you know, I, you mentioned the chess bras. Um, I've, I've been lucky enough to interview, um, I'm on Hamilton, Grandmaster Hamilton, and uh, I am Eric Rosen. So that's how I've gotten a little bit of color about, um, how Twitch, how Twitch streaming works. Um, mm-hmm. so you were in an interesting position in that you knew some very prominent people or you were encouraged by some very prominent people in the chess world with the chess bras and, and uh, Danny Wrench of chess.com. Um, so once you, once you're a weekend and you start doing it, um, what are you working harder, harder on? Like, are you interfacing with people like that about how to do the Twitch streaming? Are they helping you more with the chess? Like what, what happened next as you, as you started to build an audience and get into, um, uh, streaming regularly. Uh, it was very interesting. I started streaming. I mean, as soon as I did that first day, I only streamed chess from there on out. I never went, like really streamed World of Warcraft again. Um, so my first day was really like the day that um, I went on this journey, I guess. Um, but after a week, it was kind of like I was like very. Um, I don't want to say addicted to chess, but I was addicted because. When I started streaming chess, I got to a very low rating of 250 and um, I really wanted to get better because I kept like losing on stream and I didn't want to keep losing on stream as a lot of people um, don't want to be doing. So I was constantly doing chess stuff um, on stream, off stream. At that time, I didn't really know how to learn um, to get better at chess. So it was a very, um, probably a difficult month um, because it took me a long time to like try and figure out how to actually get better at chess. Okay. Which, which lucky enough will be the, the main topic of, uh, of this interview. Um, mm-hmm. 
But Tori, could you tell us a bit more about, um, like a, a bit more about your about your background? Are you from Minnesota? Um, I think I saw somewhere. Or, or have you been a university student? Like, uh, what else goes on in your life um, besides the Twitch streaming? Yeah, so I am from here. I've never moved. Um, I have recently gone back to college. I went um, when I graduated high school, but then I um, decided not to pursue it for a while while I worked. Um, I had an office job for a couple of years and then I started streaming. And when I started streaming chess, it was just going really well. Um, so I um, currently, I believe it was only in January when I started taking classes again. And I am really lucky I can actually finish my degree online so I can um, balance um, streaming and doing classes. That's good. Yeah. And I guess like everyone's being kind of hit to different degrees by suddenly having to stay at home. But um, as as sounds like it's reasonably conducive to the lifestyle you were leading already. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. All right. So let's get to the chess because it's very rare um, that, I mean, first of all, to... Um, to make as much progress as you have in, in this amount of time, but to sort of do it in front of an audience, I find even even more interesting. So, um, so you're two. You you said you have a chess.com rating of around two fifty, and um, being that that people are watching you, you want to get better, and you don't know what to do. So, what happened next? Um, I was very. Um, I don't know if I was in a lucky position or unlucky. I think it was a mix of both because. Um, I had a lot of trolls in my chat also, but I also had some really incredible people that were watching me who are still like great supporters of my stream and some are even my friends now, um, who actually gave me very um, great advice um, because a lot of people, because I didn't know what time control to play right away. I think I was playing like five minutes maybe right away. And I mean, of course, I was like losing on time. I was just like blundering pieces all over. So um, a lot of people told me to slow down do a slower time control. So I started doing 1510, which is um, to this day been my favorite time control to play. Um, people also told me to do tactics. And I really didn't know. Um, the first time I did tactics, I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. I like I got this position. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Is there like a checkmate in one or what? Like, um, So I had to have a lot of people explain how to do tactics correctly, which is um, finding the best move. Um, but that took a while. But those two things really helped me. That's cool. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of a cool experiment. So, so just to sort of set the scene properly, when you started Twitch streaming, you you mentioned you got a rating of two hundred and fifty. But let's mm -hmm. just so did you know what on passant was? Did you know about bringing out pieces, or were you really starting at at level uh, zero? I guess we would say. I was really starting at level zero. There's actually a really great clip of me from um, November of 2018 where I actually learned what Enpissant was and I actually got to play it in a game. And I'm just like freaking out because it's such like a mind boggling idea. I'm like, oh my God, like I can take this pawn that um, you can typically can't take. And then castling was another thing that, I mean, my dad taught me how the pieces move, but he didn't teach me Enpissant or castling. So those two things were just like a mind blowing idea for me when I learned. Okay. And are those on, I saw that you have a YouTube channel. Um, mm -hmm. Is that on your YouTube channel? Do you know? They, I don't think they are. I started doing my YouTube channel, I believe in January of 2019. So um, a lot of that content that's on my YouTube now is when I kind of like knew a lot of the basics already. Okay. Cause I'm going to ask you a beginner Twitch person question. So is, right. is something like what you mentioned with the en passant clip, is that archived? Like are, are your streams archived after they happen? Um, streams will expire after, um, I believe it's two weeks, maybe four weeks, but, um, people that clip your stream, so like taking the little, um, about like 30 seconds to a minute of your clip of your stream, um, those are called clips and those are actually saved forever. So they the little clip of me doing Empathant, um, will forever be there for people to see me being that, at like 300. And for that, they just go to your Twitch page. Yep, they do. Okay. Excellent. Um, okay, and I, well, I'll probably ask you some more sort of ignorant Twitch questions later, but for for now, we'll, we'll bring it back to the chess improvement. Um, okay. So you figure out what tactics are. Now you you know to look for forcing moves, checks, captures, and attacks. And then what what were you doing the chess.com tactics trainer? Or were you ordering books? What what did you use to uh, to work on your tactics? 
I have um, done chess.com tactics trainer. It's still what I use today. I um, really like it. I've tried to use books and I've tried to do like, um, like um, chessable, uh, but I, my brain just doesn't like process it as well. Um, chessable is probably close, but books are just a complete no go for me. I just like, it's, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> books are way harder for me to process for me and to learn from. So chess.com tactics trainer has, um, done a lot for me. Yeah. I saw your puzzle rush skills yesterday. I was pretty mm-hmm. impressed. You got, <laughs> I think you got like a 25 or something when I was, when I was watching and that's, that's really good for, for only having done chess for a year. Thank you. So how much time are you spending on tactics, Tori? Um, I am kind of addicted to tactics. Even if I'm not necessarily playing games like a lot, I will always play tactics. I play tactics when I wake up and I'm still in bed. I play tactics when I'm waiting in line. I play tactics while I'm eating. I play tactics um, when I'm trying to fall asleep. I mean, I really do as many tactics as I can um, pretty much in a day. So hour, hours a day, it's safe to say? Probably. Okay. Yeah. And do you ever take days off? Not really. Tactics are something that I can consistently really enjoy in chess. So I never really feel um, like burnt out or anything like that because it's more of like an enjoyable thing for me. And I like I always like um, when I get like a really tough tactic, it's always so satisfying to find the solution. So I really enjoy them. So what's your approach if you're struggling with one? We've we, Obviously, we talk about how to approach tactic solving a lot here on mm-hmm. Perpetual Chess. Um, are you someone who will give up eventually or are you, or are you like you have to get it and you're just going to s- stick with it till you get it? Um, it depends on the day for me. Most of the time I try and figure it out. I feel like, um, since I've done so many tactics, I have a very good tactical vision. So I feel like there's not a lot of situations where I just get really stuck. Um, there's, there is quite a lot of times though, where I am doing a tactic and, um, my idea that I think is like the best move ever and, um, turns out to not actually be the solution. Um, but then I just keep working through and usually after I play it, I see why that was not the best solution, even if it's still winning, but yeah. (laughs) So you're going to hear my guest, Gold Dust Tori, echo the advice of many perpetual guests before her, that one of the keys to her success in improving so quickly is doing lots of tactics. Luckily, if it's tactics that you seek, chessable.com has you covered. You can go to their site and you can filter for your experience level, your price point, and choose from there. They've got renowned tactics courses ranging from tune your chess tactics antenna for the more advanced, tactics time for the intermediate, mastering mates for newer chess players. They just have tactics stuff across the spectrum and of course their space repetition methodology makes sure you help that you remember these patterns that you learn. So go to chessable.com and check it out. What else is in, I mean, I've seen you do some, um, like I know you've done some, online classes with uh gm danya naroditsky um i know uh you and jan ludwig hammer seem to have done some stuff together so and they seem to be helping you out with openings like what what other areas of the game do you do you work on um as of now i've really been working hard um trying to because overall my mid game and tactics are very good at this point um but lately i would say since i was i got to like 1500 and now i'm like around 1600 um people know their openings really well and i feel like i'm kind of behind on that so i've really been trying to learn uh, more solid openings and theory and stuff like that and also End games are the worst for me. Um, I think it's pretty common, but end games are so hard, especially when it comes to king and pawn end games. I really struggle. So I've been slowly trying to get better at those. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them are very nuanced. But the the good thing is, if you, if you continue to build your calculation skills, um, a lot of it can be calculated as mm-hmm. you as you um, as you get more experience with them. And just sort of the main thing is just. King king upon end games are almost always trickier than they look, so it's good yeah. to just avoid avoid the the trick of just I mean avoid the habit of just moving instantly. But I mean, mm-hmm. but it seems like you're you're spending your time pretty wisely. Um, so Tori, we're gonna hop into the first question from a Patreon supporter. 
Um, so for listeners who are not familiar, uh, people who help support Perpetual Chess find out the guests in advance. And this first question, I know that this gentleman was particularly excited because he had just sent me an email, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was him, a few weeks before saying he ne- he was hoping to hear from more sort of newer to chess uh adult improvers, because I know there's new people constantly coming to the chess world. Um, and we want them to, f- to feel welcome in the chess world, which we'll talk about later, Tori, um, and uh, to feel like they know what to do. So I'm that's another reason I'm happy to have you on the show. And here is the question from Gregorius uh, Oikonomu. I should have asked you how to pronounce that, Gregorius. I hope I did okay. Um, okay. He says, hi, Tori. A common advice is that if you want to improve in chess, you you need to play longer games. As someone who's made great progress while playing mostly blitz and rapid, as far as I can tell, what's your personal take on this? Is playing on faster time controls a necessary evil of streaming, or is this a case of quantity having a quality of its own? Um, I really enjoy longer time controls, especially if they have increment. Like I said earlier, 1510 is my favorite time control. Um, I actually only started playing blitz um, probably about six months ago, maybe, um, because I spent so much time playing rapid. And um, as viewers um, on Twitch watching chess, a lot of them prefer watching Blitz and Bullet, as a lot of the other streamers do. So I've started to um, include it more into my streams now. But I don't think that they really um, help my chess as much uh, compared to when I play rapid games. I feel like I have so much time to think about the best move and... Um, I'm able to analyze it and I'm able to be like, oh, I played this game really nicely, not because I was on like time pressure, um, but because I had the time to think about the best move and um, how to win the position. So that's, that's um, very good perspective. So do listeners, I mean, do viewers ever uh, grumble that you're not playing faster time controls? Uh, I have a very interesting audience now because people used to do that to me um, a lot when I started streaming chess, people would be like, why are you playing like such long time controls? And people like would leave because I'm playing like 15, 10. Um, but now it's really interesting because people are like, why aren't you playing rapid? And then if I start playing like bullet, like people leave. So yeah. um, it's complete opposite from a lot of other streamers now, but you just can't win. I can't, but <laughs> I really like how it is now where um, people are really happy with the longer time controls. Well, yeah. And it does sound like you, you got very good advice early on. I, I do think, it, it would have been a lot harder to make the progress you had. I mean, there's just so much to process in chess that mm-hmm. I mean, for anyone in, in a position similar to Gregorius looking to improve, I think blitz is particularly counterproductive. The, the less experienced you are, the more counterproductive it can be. Um, once you reach around Tori's level, I do think, um, I mean, you know, it probably isn't, the a theme that has emerged in all these interviews I've done is it's probably not the highest and best use of your time, but I don't think it hurts either. And mm-hmm. if you're taking the game seriously and reviewing, like say you get a king and pawn in game and you didn't know how to play it and you're reviewing it, um, then it can actually be helpful. Or if you're using it to to sharpen up your repertoire, so on and so forth. Um, uh, we've got another question, Tori. Um, this one is from Jason Woolham. And Jason asks, what's the best piece of advice that you learned from all of the different chess streamers that you've talked to, um, either chess or streaming related? Um, I've been really lucky. And um, since I started streaming chess, I've known a lot of really amazing chess streamers. Um, A lot of people are titled, so they can't exactly relate to me in every single way. But it's interesting because even if our ratings are so different and our streams are different in that way, Um, The issues that we all encounter is kind of the same. So it's really um, awesome that they have, like, given me so much advice, not only on chess and how to improve, but how to deal with, like, um, a lot of issues I encounter. Because they've encountered it, even if it was, like, 10 years ago. Like, um, one of my big things recently was in December, I was starting to feel really burnt out on chess. I'm like, I'm not enjoying it as much, and I don't know what to do. Um, But I had a lot of people tell me about how... Um, they've all been there. Every single chess player has been there. And to just keep playing, and um, even if you need a break, sometimes the breaks are even better. Um, When you come back, you play better. So um, generally, a lot of the advice that's been given to me, even if we're on completely different levels in chess, has been really helpful and relatable. Can can you think of anything specific um, 
especially I'm sure people are wondering like like a, a light bulb moment in terms of uh, your game, like something that that you hadn't thought of that someone pointed out to you? <laughs> this is such a funny thing. It's kind of like a joke in my stream now, um, but I do love spins with um, GM Donnie Naroditsky, as we mentioned earlier. And it was such a small thing, but he has really um, pushed me to really like um, think differently in my games. And there's this one move, F4, that I never in my entire like year of playing chess ever thought to do. And he was like, play F4 here, because I'm a very aggressive player. And um, Donnie like, really understands that. And whenever I get the chance, I do F4 in a game, because most of the time it's like such a... Um, I don't know. I, I love the F4 move. It's such a small thing. Um, okay, so Jason yeah. Willem, you start playing F4. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all of your problems will be solved. I no, love that move. No, but I also wanted to to circle back Tori, to um what you mentioned about being burned out because that that was a question in my outline and and hearing you talk about it, it occurs to me that you're kind of in a unique position because as a as a Twitch streamer, you're already relying on chess as a as a portion of your income. I would imagine so. Um, when when this when you were given when you had this feeling and you were given this advice. Did you stop streaming or did you keep going? Um, I mean, obviously gone, you didn't quit, but did you end up mm -hmm. taking a break? Um, I've gone through different periods around my burnout actually started back in November and I actually kept streaming through it, but it actually was making it worse and I was not enjoying it as much. So um, I was really lucky because I wasn't burnt out on chess. I was kind of burnt out on streaming chess, I think, which made me kind of burnt out on chess. <laughs> so, um, but I actually... I was doing my first over the board tournament in December. So I was going to be gone for about a week and I couldn't really stream during that time. And uh, that actually made me like really kind of like um, start to enjoy chess again because I was like surrounded by all these chess people and I was playing really long time controls, which I found I really, really enjoyed. And um, being able to like see like the potential of my chess, like during those long time controls was really satisfying and, um, I don't know. It, it just made me really start to enjoy the game again overall. Yeah, I was eager to hear about that over the board tournament because I, I follow you on Twitter and you mentioned before that you were going. And obviously, I mean, it's um, live tournaments are a totally different experience. I mean, you really you see um, you see chess players for for all of their quirks and to, like the social dynamics and the psychological dynamics can be different so i'm glad to hear that it sounds like you enjoyed the experience mm -hmm. no i had a great time it was i really look forward to whenever i can do my next one and people generally um you felt like you were you were treated fairly um and respectfully um yeah every, i really had a great time people are so helpful um because it was my first over the board tournament i didn't really know everything i'm like i didn't know how like tournaments really work but um i had some friends at the tournament too and they kind of just like guided me they're like okay you have to um be here you can set up the t like text to get notified um what table you'll be at and like um, all that so um people were really helpful and i think a lot of people were really eager to see how i was going to do in my first tournament too and how did you feel like you did um, <laughs> um i went four out of seven which is generally pretty good um I do, there was a, round three was really rough. <laughs> um, and we I'm, should say, was this the North American Open in Vegas? Is that right? It was. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Round three was really rough on me. I was winning. I had like two pieces up and then I accidentally blundered my queen. Um, and a lot of people think I got tilted after this game, which is definitely something that could have happened. But I right. actually lost my next two games. And then I actually was like, I was at a point where I'm like, I'm going to withdraw from the tournament <laughs> if I don't win my first game on the last day. And luckily, I won my last two games on the last day. So, uh, But yeah, it was definitely an experience and definitely a learning experience too. Um, yeah. Again, Tori, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's just, what I've been told. <laughs> yeah. it's. Uh, I mean, it's like uh, if you're playing a lot, it's like a once every couple month experience. Like you think about quitting just routinely mm -hmm. you, even though you love it it's just like part of the process oh yeah um so did that um did that so when you came back from the tournament were you fired up to study more chess or did you feel like you needed a break or what 
I was really eager to get better because it was one of those things that was like, I was really, I'm the type of person where if I'm not satisfied with something, I really want to work harder to um, be able to get better or complete it or whatever. So um, when I got back to my tournament, I was like, okay, I just want to work really hard so I can do really good in my next tournament. Um, because now I didn't just have like my online rating. I had like my USCF rating and I was really not happy with my provisional rating I got. So I really want to do another tournament um, whenever I get the chance to again, of course. And um, really, hopefully... Um, I'm a lot stronger then, and um, with the experiences and lessons I learned from my last tournament, hopefully I can um, win most of my games again. Yeah, you you had a funny tweet recently where it was like a picture of a strong person, and it yeah. said, <laughs> me when I play my first OTB tournament post-quarantine, watch out, seven-year-olds have been out here grinding. Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> again, a very relatable, Tori. <laughs> um yeah, the the kids are tough, but you you got to be ready for them. So, um, so did you look at your games with Danya, or look at them on your stream, or what was your approach of analyzing your games from your first uh, live tournament? Um, because I I analyzed them so many times, um, I'm very lucky because when I was at the tournament, I of course had friends at the tournament, um, like Hans Neiman was there. Um, John Williams, Alexandra Botez. Um, and so every time I'd finish a game, they all seemed so excited to um, see what my game was like and how I did. And so they all looked at my games and they're all able to give me my opinions and stuff like that. And I, of course, did my own like analyzing when um, that night when I got back to the hotel. Um, but then when I got back from the tournament, me and Donya, um, did, we did a stream where we analyzed my games. And it's actually up on my YouTube also for anybody to see um how my games were in general but um it was definitely those games were very analyzed very well over a couple week period um good that that's that's the key um so what were the lessons you derived from from uh going over these games with a fine-tooth comb um so the games that i won were actually generally pretty good games um I, i had a lot of very nice tactical um, positions. There was one game, I think it was my last game, where um, I just, I think it was just a general lack of um, experience that um, kind of bit me. I won it, but it definitely should have been won a lot sooner. So we learned um, that a lot. Then my round three, which I mentioned before, <laughs> which still hurts my heart to this day, um, I definitely really learned to just sit. You have the time to sit there and think about your move. You don't have to play so quickly. Even though I was generally taking my time control very well, um, that was one move that I did so quickly and I completely regretted it <laughs> ever since. So um, definitely playing slower. And um, yeah, I mean, generally, I think when you um, play a game and if you don't do too well, you just need to try and like um, brush it off and move on to the next game and try and like, focus all your energy into that game yeah so does did and for again with with the th- round three game we can all relate and it's so agonizing because as you mentioned it's just one fast move and then months to think about it mm-hmm. you know, oh yeah so, <laughs> definitely so, months so disproportionate you know mm-hmm. um so but did uh in in your analysis did you have like a new to-do list in terms of the, i mean you mentioned some practical considerations like not rushing or maybe getting a little overconfident when you're winning but what about like actual uh study tasks did you feel like you had new new points of emphasis after the tournament um there's definitely some areas that we covered um such as like very positional stuff because the two games I lost after round three, um, I just felt like I was getting completely um, destroyed, I guess, by those kids. Um, They played very well. And um, so definitely um, what we looked at with Danya with those games that there's a lot of moves that I, um, I just didn't even think of at all. So um, that was one thing is like um, thinking of like all the possible moves. Um, another thing is end games. Um, my end games are kind of rough. So like I mentioned earlier, so definitely it's been a goal since that tournament to really work my end games. One of my um, opponents actually made me um, 
um, checkmate with a king and queen instead of resigning. So I really had to make sure I wouldn't stalemate him. I was really well, nervous. I about hope you. It. I hope you have that one down, Tori. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so what are you gonna do for your end games? Um, lately, I've been going through the chess.com drills. Um, we've been doing that on stream a couple times. Um, another thing is that um, when I've been doing the lessons with Donnie, he'll set up positions for me and he'll um, and we'll work through them together, which has been really helpful because um, calculating that much is very, very hard, especially when it's just king and pawn. So um, definitely a process. It's definitely going to take a long time before I feel very confident in my end games, but definitely a work in progress. Yeah, those drills are really good on chess.com. Um, mm -hmm. de definitely a good way to tighten up your end games, especially because as you mentioned, you're you're not as into the books. So, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but these days, I really don't think, I mean, I think it, practicing against the computer and just getting those positions down is uh, is very, um, very good way to, um, to improve your end games. So mm -hmm. um, you, you've mentioned your, your lessons with uh, GM Naroditsky, Danya, a couple times. Um, so when you're not analyzing games, what's a typical lesson with him like? And I know you've you've shown some of them. Are you streaming all of them or only um, a portion? Um, they're completely streamed. So they're on my Twitch and are also on um, Danya's Twitch where we um, co-stream them together. Um, but we cover, of course, um, games that I have played before. We also just one thing where I played a couple games live on stream and we will mute each other and Danya will commentate um, his opinions of my game on his stream. And I'll talk about why I think like certain things are good, why certain things aren't, where I messed up on my stream. And then after the game, we will unmute ourselves and we will talk about the game together and analyze it. That's cool. So do you have a sense for like in terms of what you stream is, is one format more popular than another whether it be your lessons with Danya or you just playing games or doing Puzzle Rush or whatever it may be? Um, people really, I think people really like to watch me play rapid games because not only am I playing games, I feel like show like a lot better of my chess potential, but also I can chat more um, while I do them. So um, I think that's one thing why a lot of people like my streams is because um, I talk so much to chat. Um but yeah, the lessons are a huge hit. We only do them about once a month right now. I think we're going to be doing them more often. Um, but I get questions every day. It's like, when's the next lesson with Dania? Because people really look forward to them. Because not only do we do them to work on my chest, but we also try and keep it as open as possible that um, people in chat um, can learn stuff too from them. Yeah, that's an amazing resource for, for anyone. I mean, to, mm -hmm. to, to be able to pick the brain of a, a player of that caliber. Oh, yeah. And to talk to Dania too. Oh, Danya is amazing. He is. Um, he, I, I would feel so lost. I think without him as a coach, because he's helped me so much, and he's just one of the nicest people. Yeah, I gotta get, or at least invite him on the show at some point. Um, oh yeah, for uh, sure. Everyone has nothing but good things to say, and and mm -hmm. obviously, very accomplished player, and I like his writing as well. So, um, so we've we've. Got some questions about dealing with haters, but first, Tori, I wanted to touch on one more bright topic. You just uh, competed in the Isolated Queens tourney uh, tournament organized by uh, the aforementioned Alexandra Botez and uh, and Jennifer Shahadi. So could you tell us a little bit about what that tournament was and what the experience was like? Um, yep, the Isolated Queens tournament um, was hosted, as you said, by Alexandra Botez, Jen Shahadi, and U.S. Chess Woman. Um, and I was invited to play on it. I actually didn't know how many people were going to be playing in it because to win prizes, you had to stream it. And uh, there's not like a whole lot of female chess streamers. So I didn't know how many people are going to be playing in it. But it actually came out to be, I think, around 90 players, which was to me, I was like, oh, my God, that's so many. I didn't know how many people were going to be playing until I actually joined the tournament that day of. Um, so it was an incredible turnout. And um I was um, I was in a weird rating range um, because the time control was 3-2. Uh, and like I said before, I focused my entire chess career playing really long time controls and kind of staying away from blitz. Um, so I actually, for the two days before the tournament, I had to really kind of learn how to play 3-2. Um, I'm very lucky I had an increment because if it didn't have an increment, I think I would be completely lost. Um, but yeah. I had a really good tournament. 
Yeah, and you got to play like Irina Ka- Crush and Katerina Nemsova, right? Among yep. probably some others. That's that's amazing. I mean, that's a great experience. Um, and uh, you gave uh, I, you gave Katerina a reasonable game. Is that right? I did. It was a really solid game. I think um, it was just like a lack of experience in like end games um, where <laughs> um, the, and I lost on time too, of course. So um, it was definitely a really good game, though. I'm really excited to look that over with Danya um, because yeah. I mean, that's just I mean, it was such an amazing opportunity to not only play like um, like other female chess players, but to play some really iconic ones like Arena um, and Katarina, too. So um, it was just a really awesome experience to, um, cause you don't, not a lot of people get that opportunity that often. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's awesome that they organize that. Uh, um, they're Alexandra and Jen and us chess women. They're, they're doing such incredible things to, to help promote chess for, for women. Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel like that's like an important issue? Like, so you, you said you mostly had fun when you went to an all, over the board tournament. Did you feel any, um, any unwelcome or uh, judgment from the, I'm assuming, predominantly male <laughs> player base? Um, you know, I never got any of that. I mean, people, I think a lot of, I was um, recognized a couple times, and those people, um, even of like their viewers from my stream, they were very like excited to see how I was doing. Like, uh, people, like, they would see me walking around, and they'd be like, oh, how'd your game go? So uh, people were very excited for me overall. I don't know if I got like any hate or anything um for yeah usually any people, of that usually people are nicer in real life oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> which which does bring us to the topic of um you know dealing with trolls or haters or whatever you want to call them online mm-hmm. i know that you you've expressed some frustration on, on on twitter at times which um is totally understandable um so we've got a couple related questions from supporters of the podcast um so uh, the first one is from friend of the podcast, Han Shu himself, an adult improver who has been on the show. And Han asks, he says, uh, Tori, congratulations on your chess and streaming success. I saw your win against the WFM and the chess.com women's chess tournament. Amazing progress. Personal question. A lot of very successful women on social media seem to combine periods of highs with lows. Um by highs, he means happiness. Is that the case for you? And if so, what is causing this in your opinion? Taylor Swift told us in the documentary Miss Americana that she strived for and has achieved happiness without anyone else's input. Um, so happiness independent of reviews, record sales, awards, viewers, likes, etc. What do you think of this? Can you imagine that for yourself? Um, I definitely go through those periods um, pretty often. Uh, I think it's because I'm exposed to so many people's inputs and outputs. I mean, um, when I stream, I have 100, 200 people posting in chat um, what their opinions are. And not all of them are very positive. And also, like, my Twitter is getting more popular, too. So I get a lot of comments um, of, of what people think. Um, which a lot of people are generally very nice and kind and helpful, um, but there's definitely a minority of people that um, seem to be a little bit more negative. Um, I actually just watched Taylor Swift's documentary. I don't know if you've seen it, but um, she did touch on that subject. And I completely agree with her that um, the ideal way to happiness is to try and um, not take others' inputs um, into your own opinions, I suppose. Um, but like I said, it's very, very hard as a streamer when you're being exposed to so many people's uh, opinions. I've been working um, very hard over the last year to um, not to let that happen. And it's gotten a lot better. There's some comments that just don't affect me anymore compared to a year ago where it was like someone would be like, oh, you're so low rated. Like that bothered me so much for the longest time. But um, now people like I don't really get that comment as much anymore, but. It doesn't affect me as much if people do say stuff that to that um, to me now. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you're dealing with a lot. Number one, because you're a woman. I mean, mm-hmm. I just see see the way that women are treated online. Obviously, not just in the chess world, but it's it's no better in the chess world. I think it's fair to say. Um, just the things that people say to them, the 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 lack of respect they're sometimes given, um, is is really disheartening. And it would be very tough to get used to, I think. Um, so that's obviously one reason. And then another is just the nature of your work. Like I, you know, this this podcast is 
pretty popular, but I'm it's not that interactive, you mm-hmm. know. So I'm not, you know, I love to hear from listeners. I love it when they send me emails. Um, love to interact with them wherever possible. But that the nature of this show is that I'm interacting with the guest and other people are listening. Whereas mm-hmm. the, whereas the nature of what you're doing is interaction. So that's that's got to make it a challenge as well. Yeah, I think I'm definitely in the minority also because I really like to share my opinions of like how I'm feeling, how um, certain things are going. I like to be very open with my community. And that's not always positive as you've seen on Twitter too. But I feel like it's made my community very strong um, and relatable. There's a lot of people that can relate to me also, even if they're not streamers. So um, I even if it's like not exactly like the brightest thing on your timeline of the day, um, I feel like it's been really important to me and my community and my stream in general to share. And have you gotten any advice from other women in the chess community, whether they be streamers like Alexandra Botez or just chess players about how, how to handle this issue? Yeah. Um, like I said, um, around the beginning of the, um, when we started recording, um, even though I am at a completely different position than a lot of other chess streamers, our, a lot of our issues are very similar. Um, and it was very interesting to me when it was first kind of exposed to me because I had huge issues with people like um, making fun of my rating for quite a while until I hit about like 1,200. Um, and it was very interesting that like no matter who was streaming, if it was like Alexandra or Anna Rudolph, um, a lot of them also got comments that time saying like, you're too low rated, especially when it came to commentating. Um so overall, I mean, a lot of what you have to do is that it doesn't matter how good you are in chess or what your rating is. There is always going to be those people making those comments and they don't actually like reflect anything off you. Yeah, which dovetails perfectly into our next question. So this is from um, popular author, streamer. Um, I am Chess Explained, Christoph Zalecki, friend of the show. He's been on the show. So he actually asked two parts, but I'm going to start with the one that relates directly to what we're talking about. Okay. Um, so Christoph says, uh, when, um, when you discuss the online haters, I'd like to share something that's always helped me. I've probably gotten less hate than her, but I had my share of trolls and idiots. At some point, I made a connection to a scene from a movie, and he shared the link, which I shared with you, um, mm-hmm. which... And then he says, you need to learn that people only hate you because you're winning. If you let the hate get to you, you turn into a loser. It's all about envy, nothing else. That's why they troll. Whenever I get some troll stuff nowadays, I always think about this scene and remind myself um, why they troll and how to react, ignore, and enjoy that you are winning. Um, yeah, I, I've seen that scene. I believe that he posted to in reply to one of my tweets recently. Um, and for the people listening, it's basically a scene from a movie where um, a guy's just telling someone, are you so much of a loser that you can't see that you're winning? Basically saying that like you're focusing so much on the negative that you're not seeing that you have so much positive. Um, so I actually really like this clip. I didn't I've never seen it before until um, it was replied to one of my tweets. Um, and I think it's like such a great point that I mean, of course, there's going to be negatives and sometimes they feel way heavier than um, the positives. But when you think about it, a lot of these people are only posting because you're doing something that they probably can't be doing. You are in a position that um, you um, have so much like input. Um, like me, I have like a lot of viewers, followers and stuff like that now where if I was if I had like 10 followers, I probably wouldn't be getting like any of the comments like that. So um, I'm definitely doing something right, um, which feels really good. Um, And some of the, I have a very good um, mentality now that a lot of the haters actually very encourage me, especially with my rating. Um, Like I said, um, I've gotten a lot of comments on how like low my rating is. And I think that's been one of my biggest motivators to get better. Yeah. And, and, it's obviously worked. Um, and we should say the scene is from from Dust Till Dawn, Quentin Tarantino movie. And I'll link to the scene in question uh, in, in the show description for anyone interested in checking it out. But but yeah, I mean, it is. The, unfortunately, the, the reality is that the more successful you get, Tori, the, the, the haters, there's only going to be more of them. But mm-hmm. I do feel like people are getting better at figuring out how to deal with them. Like I like that 
my friend Jennifer Shahadi now when she gets particularly ridiculous comments, sometimes she'll just retweet them, you know? Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> people have this, you know, they it's the anonymity of the internet that often brings out the worst in people. So mm-hmm. um, by putting them on blast um, you, and then like people who are actually supportive come after those people sometimes um, not, you know, in, in the comments or whatever. So. Um, yeah, keep, keep your head up and it, yeah, always look out for your mental health. I mean, especially, especially now that we can't leave our houses. Oh yeah. I think like some of the hate is such great content too, to kind of, um, put up, I don't know if like you've seen my Twitter banner, but it was a guy that actually used to make fun of like my play, like, um, that I wasn't playing very good. And he actually replied to one of my tweets. And it's like, um, I remember when I used to make fun of your play and now you're higher rated than me. Oh, that's um, cool. That's yeah, awesome. so it's like little comments like that where it's like um, it feels kind of good to um, get some of those comments sometime and you can actually bring something good out of it, whether it be like good content. Yeah, and, and you know, for anyone listening, I mean, I'm guessing, you know, there might be some people who have moments of jealousy. I mean, it's perfectly normal to feel jealous of people at times, but... I mean, it, it, it's just the the worst impulse. So it's it's important to to override that feeling. And also, I mean, anyone listening to the show loves chess and wants chess to be more popular. And um, in order for chess to continue to grow as it has, which we're, we're lucky that it that it has, um, it needs to be as supportive of an environment as possible. So, mm-hmm. um, so I'm I mean, I'm glad, Tori, that. Uh, that you feel like you've you've made some strides in your own approach to dealing with them, but hopefully, um, hopefully, uh, we can have a more civil discourse at some point. I mean, obviously, th- th- it's not an issue that only applies to chess. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, okay, um, and I'm gonna circle back to the other half of uh, Christoph Zalecki's question, um, which I found interesting because he. <laughs> I mean, we'll get to it in a second, but then I watched your stream yesterday and noticed what he was talking about. So yeah. here, we, here we go. <laughs> he says. Uh, Tori has a peculiar way of hovering the pieces over the board, like checking what kind of possibilities the piece has. And he says, maybe you should watch her stream. You'll immediately see what I refer to. And actually, I didn't even remember that comment when I watched, but I just, I saw anyway. And then mm-hmm. he says, so she's the only one I've se- ever seen doing that. It could be really scary for the viewer <laughs> because you fear you fear she would actually play some of these really bad possibilities. Then eventually she'll play a good move most of the time. But it's a strange way of playing. I wonder if there's some concept she was taught. Or she's doing it without even noticing it. Just curious to know if there's ba- some background to it. Um, it's something you can't do in OTB chess. Um, I actually have no idea how I started doing this. I think it's something that maybe when I um, started playing chess online that I just, um, I don't know. I have no idea how it started. Um, but it's not something I really do consciously or something that really helps me. I think it does show the viewers, though, my thought process. Because even if it's like a really bad move. It's usually the first um, move that comes to mind. And um, it's kind of like an eye tracker in a way <laughs> of like I'm moving my pieces to show like what um, possibilities are coming to my mind. Um, and then eventually I'll just keep looking at one piece and like one move um, and then I'll play a move. Um, but <laughs> I it's something I've been trying to um, stop doing as much because um a lot of people don't like it. Yeah, it a lot of people say they get some anxiety exactly, watching yeah. it. So definitely a work in um, progress. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Stop I mean, doing that. Yeah. I, you know, chess is, it, it's such mental anguish that it would be hard. I mean, it, uh, it's a, also a testament. I mean, the general improvement you've made in chess is a testament, but the fact that you've done it while streaming is all the more impressive because um, it's, it's a whole separate skill set. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, so one more question, uh, from Dennis Boros, uh, Grandmaster Dennis Boros, who has also been on the show. Um, and he asks, uh, what was your first impression about our chess society? And looking back now, what has changed? Um, when I started streaming chess, um, on Twitch, I mean, that was the only thing I was really exposed to is chess on Twitch for quite a while. Um, I would say it took me about nine months until I was exposed to like what chess was like over the board. Um, because I went to a Stinkfield Cup tournament um, and got to meet like so many people. 
Um, but my first impression for quite a while was um, I had a lot of trolls in my chat and like people can be really mean. Um, but I've been really lucky because I've been too exposed to like extremely positive people. I mean, Danish, the um, one asking the question is an amazing person. He is in my chat all the time, giving me like, great advice. He's like just seriously one of the nicest people I've met. Um and so my first opinion isn't very accurate because I think the people that are very positive in chess are so positive and they're the type of people that you'd want to be friends with because um, it's all about building each other up and helping each other. So, yeah. So, so would you say your perception has changed or just that you've gotten to know more people? Like, how would you describe the chess community to someone who's never played chess? Um, I think it definitely depends. And you can be honest, what, I should say, Tori. Yeah, <laughs> I think it definitely depends on what area of chess you're in, whether if you're only exposed to Twitch chess and like what streamer you're also watching completely depends um, or like um, you have a different experience. Over the board, I feel like over the board has been a very positive thing for me. Um, that, I feel like, yeah, it's very positive. That's really good to hear. So you had your your next live tournament already planned before the uh, quarantine, right? Um, yep, I wanted to do the, I believe it is the U.S. Open. It's in Vegas again. It was the one the at Nas the National Open, maybe. Mm, I don't remember. Okay, doesn't matter now. Um, oh wait, yeah, the National Open. Yeah, that's what it was. The National Open. I really wanted to do that one in June. Um, because again, I knew a lot of people that are going to be playing in it, and um, it was also a big tournament too. So I was really looking forward to that, but it kind of looks like that won't be happening now. Yeah, probably not. We don't know for sure. But so that's still a pretty long gap between your prior tournament. Do you have any thoughts of like getting involved locally um, in Minnesota? Uh, I unfortunately don't have a lot of local options. Um, <laughs> so. I guess um, I'm going to keep streaming chess and um, work on chess that way. Um, and then hopefully whenever, um, you know, the coronavirus gets better and it's not so much of a risk for people, um, hopefully tournaments will happen frequently again where I can have an opportunity to play in one. And do you have any thoughts? Um, I don't know how far you've thought ahead in terms of your content creation. Like, are you going to stream from from the tournaments potentially or do vlogs or anything like that? Yeah, I um, I was actually going to do all that in my first tournament, but it was such a I was really sick during my first tournament, too. So uh, the time that I could do all that, I would rather rest because right. I was sick. But um, definitely for like my next tournament and, um, you know, pro chess league and chess party was supposed to happen in oh, right. May. And I was going to, you know, do IRL streaming um, there. I was going to stream during the um, event and um yeah, so I definitely want to get more into that. We're going to events and doing that sort of stuff too. Excellent. Yeah, that that sounds pretty fun. Um, so, Tori, let's go back uh, before I let you go, if you're okay. Um, mm -hmm. As we were joking before we were recording, no one has anything to do. I mean, so yeah. like, we, you know, we're not going out later. So um, might as well ask you a couple more questions. So you're, you're doing tactics for hours a day. You're doing your online course. Is there... Um, is there anything else that you feel like you've left out in terms of chess study, like in terms of advice you could impart to people um, who are newer to chess and w would like to try to replicate your success? Um, you know, I wish I had more to say. I get this question a lot. And I think, you know, I mean, generally what I just keep saying is I do tactics, I do long time controls and I analyze my games. Um, and I also put in the hours. I mean, I think that's a big thing is just putting in the time into chess. Um, but I wish I had like a big secret I could share with people. Um, well, yeah. I really think those are three excellent bullet points. I mean, those are, mm -hmm. that's really that those three things will take you, take you so far. Oh yeah. Um, and do you ever, do you ever do tactics? I mean, I saw you do puzzle rush on stream. Are you ever like just studying tactics on stream or is that more for your own personal study time? Um, definitely my own personal study time. Um, I have found that doing tactics and studying on stream doesn't really work with my stream that well. Um, either like, viewers don't really want to watch it or also this is a big thing of why I don't do it is because 
I can't focus and I can't remember um, a lot of the stuff I supposedly learned on stream. Um, so when I do the lesson streams with Donnie, I actually um, have to rewatch the entire VOD after to get the full um, information out of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you ever do you play much chess when you're not streaming? Um, I've started to recently. Um, before I did it uh, as much, but I'd say in the last like six months, I definitely have played more. I've been playing um, a lot of Bullet lately um, off stream because it's just such a quick time control where it's like I can get like a couple games in between like homework assignments or whatever I'm doing. Um, yeah, and I play some like a couple like um, Blitz and Rapid games off stream or off stream, but. Um, I definitely do most of my games, I'd say, on stream. Yeah. The the reason I was asking is I was just wondering um, if you felt like you were stronger when you're not streaming, because I, I've a few of the people I've interviewed who do stream a lot have mentioned that. And it seems intuitively to me like you might be even better if you ever got to play without having to, to talk through it and, you know, engage with your audience and so on. I'm definitely it was something I wasn't really aware of right away because the only um, chess I really played for a long time was on stream. But when I started playing off stream, it was like, it was just so much easier. Like my, I wasn't like getting as low on time. I was like finding like tactics quicker. Um, I was having to think as much on certain moves. Um, so I definitely play a lot better off stream and it can be a little frustrating sometimes because I play so good off stream. I'll get my rating like to a certain rate and I'll go on stream and I'm like, why am I playing so bad? I'll get tilted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like a bad, it can be um, a bad cycle, but um, that's why I do 1510 on stream so that I try and avoid a lot of those things. Yeah, I think, I, again, I think that's a, a very good decision. Um, all right, Tori, a couple more things. So do, do you have a current chess goal? Yeah, I um, I have a lot of chess goals. <laughs> I mean, my one for 2020 is I really want to get to 1800 Um in either Blitz or Rapid on chess.com. Um, I also eventually would like to get to 2000 um, online too. And then, of course, I have my over-the-board goal, which um, I'd like to play enough over-the-board games to not have a provisional rating anymore. And ideally, I'd like that to be maybe around 1500. Um, but we'll see how that goes and when tournaments will happen again. Yeah. So what's your, what's your provisional rating now? I know it's a sore subject, but... Yeah. Um, it is around 1100 or 1200, I believe. Oh man, you gotta, gotta, gotta play and gotta win some money, Tori. I do. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I, um, I keep joking on my stream that I'm going to do like an under 1200, um, tournament or whatever, and I'm just going to win and take home all the money from the seven year old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, I mean, what are they going to spend it on? You know, they're just going to buy like candy or whatever. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's uh, so. better with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that that makes sense. I mean, I I think you need a an established rating just for what it's worth. Um, mm -hmm. And for for any international listeners um, here in the U.S., there's a lot of fairly substantial, like thousands of dollar, like uh, the, the Bill Goitschberg Continental Chess Association tournaments have different class sections and the prizes can, can be thousands of dollars for like just playing under 1200 or even based on, on the progress you're making to, or even under 1400, under 1600. It seems like somewhere along the line, if you're doing all of your training on online games and then stepping into the, the live realm, um, somewhere along the line, you might be a little underrated live, I mm -hmm. would think. I think so too. Um, cool. Um, and Twitch goals. What like? Do you think more about business development or chess development, or are they just kind of like all all intertwined? Do you have Twitch goals as well? Um, I have Twitch goals, of course, too. As um, I mean, for quite a long time, I considered myself a streamer and then a chess player, and now it's kind of like a weird combined area where it's like I really want to get better at chess. Like I've even had times where it's like I want to do more tournaments and sacrifice streaming as much. Um, so it's definitely kind of a weird area for me right now. But like Twitch goals, I definitely just want to keep streaming and grow my community. Um, and yeah, just see where it takes me. And if anyone asks you for advice about getting into streaming, um, what, what general advice do you give? 
Um, getting to streaming is um, shockingly easy. I mean, people look at my setup and get really overwhelmed. They're like, do I need to have like a setup like yours? But I mean, you can use like your laptop. Um, you can just like use the built-in webcam and the built-in mic. Maybe it's not like the best setup, but I think it's really important for people to try it out first. See if they even like streaming before they invest in it. So, so definitely try it out and then So you've see. got the purple screen. What else differentiates your setup? Um, I have a really nice like audio system, a nice camera, a really nice PC. Um, and those were things that I actually didn't make a profit off streaming for quite a while because I kept putting the money that I got from Twitch um, back into um, what I needed for the best setup I could have. Yeah, that was probably a wise decision, I would guess. Yeah. Um, okay. Um Tori, I'm just trying to think if I have any more questions. Is there anything that, that you wanted to say um, that, that I haven't already asked you about? Um, not necessarily. It's been really awesome to be on this podcast. Like I told you earlier, um, Eric Rosen told me about this podcast a year ago. And uh, it feels like such an honor to be on it. Um, so well, I was really excited to be invited. Yeah, well, shout to Eric. Um, and yeah, well-deserved, Tori. I mean, it's really it's really impressive progress because i know like as you say you've 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 dealt with with some jealousy some some haters along the way but i mean you're really you're you're proving your worth and uh, you're you're popularizing chess so um it, it, it's great to see and hopefully um listeners also i mean i think i think your your bullet points for for how to improve chess i improve a chess i think are are quite good i mean it's there's a there's a tendency to complicate things to want things to be perfect although you didn't mention in in your bullet points you didn't mention opening so one last question Tori so mm -hmm. now that you're you mentioned you are trying to tighten up your openings like how much time do you think you're spending on openings as compared to tactics honestly not that much <laughs> I, <laughs> just to be honest I'm trying um but a lot of the stuff that I've learned just from my experiences in my other games have been working okay um I do need to work on it, of course, but um, it's definitely something that I wouldn't recommend a lot of people to focus on a whole lot until they get to like probably around 1500, maybe, maybe learn a really nice opening. And like, I've been learning the sketch gambit. I'm having so much fun with it. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and you've yeah. been, uh, you've been uh, shouting down anyone who talks trash about E4, one E4. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I think E4 is definitely the superior first opening. Though. Yeah, you don't um, care what very, Alpha Zero says. It's beautiful. Yeah, I, 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 I'm like the new Alpha Zero, so nice. I say E4 is the best move. And yeah. Okay, excellent. So Tori, I'm guessing if anyone, if anyone wants to keep up with you, Twitter, obviously your Twitch stream. Um, is there, is there anywhere else? Um, I also have my YouTube and an Instagram account. And all my usernames are very luckily for you guys. Gold Dust Tori. So easy to remember. And, easy and that's to a find Tori me. Amos ref reference? Is that? Is it's that... actually a Fleetwood Mac reference. Oh, um, really? There's a song called Gold Dust Woman. I'm a huge Fleetwood Mac fan. Oh, that's a so, great song. Um, yeah. I didn't... just used that song. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, Tori, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I wish you continued success. It seems like you're you're on a good path. Thank you. Um, have a good night. And uh, yeah, be safe. And uh, goodbye to anyone listening as well. Um, thank you so much for having me also. And I hope you have a good night. And I hope everyone is staying safe during this time. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. That includes my producer, Matthew Passy, for his timely and capable editing, Chessable.com for their generous support of the show. But I also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about Perpetual Chess, whether it be by telling a friend, writing a positive review on Spotify or YouTube, or we could use some new reviews on Apple Podcasts. If you're enjoying the show, please write a quick review. It helps spread the word about Perpetual Chess. But most of all, I want to thank the people who support the show financially people who donate via PayPal or Patreon really help me continue to sustain and grow Perpetual Chess. And those who donate more than $5 a month get their name or entity's name read on the outro. That's about to happen right now. So I would like to give special thanks to the following people and entities for their generous support of Perpetual Chess. They are chessable.com quality chess books the capital city chess club 
The Apprentice Twitch channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Natel, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, Lone Pine Chess, Lorraine DeRay, Lucio Casada Silva, The Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Kahn, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Moonmaster 9000, Moonmaster, we need a question from you. Is everything okay? We need you to send in a listener question. Peter Sadi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, and Todd Kennedy. I would also like to thank the following Rook Level supporters. They include Aaron Wafflar, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Andrew Perry, Anidi Deer, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explain, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, David Bleskachak, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Lucas of the U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am elect or possibly not I am elect. I don't know if Three Norms makes him an I am elect. Donnie Ario. Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letarte Lavoie, Frank Tortoris MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Hans Schut, Harish Srinivasan, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Banastia, James Murr, Jason Anfang, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Jerry Wells, J.J. Stranod, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Larry Ryforth, Laura Belyavsky, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspide, Mike Clem, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passam, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbuck, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Wayne Beam, William Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Jang of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, as always, for listening and interacting with the Perpetual Chess community, and I will catch you guys next week.